great pleasure to be here. I want to thank Priya uh, and Ty for literally bringing us all together. Uh, it's ex- hyper-stimulating for me, so, uh, so thank you for that. I wanted to share um, a kind of snapshot of three different forms of reasoning, at least as I, as I see them kind of roughly coalescing uh, within an area that I spend a lot of time thinking about, which is the very early universe, early universe cosmology. And so already one, th- one might begin to wonder, how do we do anything like uh, reliable inferences about a system, by which I mean the observable universe, of which there seems to be only one, uh, and of which we're a part. That's pretty different from having 10,000 independent realizations that we intervene on and so on. So to, to, in, in thinking about the meeting today, I went back and read, or in some cases reread, a number of works by some philosophers of science who've written extremely interesting things, I think, to me uh, on this uh, topic, several by one of our speakers tomorrow, Chris. I say that because if you have really hard questions, I'm just going to deflect them right to Chris at the end of today's talk. So we'll hear more about, I think, many of these things tomorrow as well. So like I say, I want to talk briefly, and I'll try to be brief, Eduardo, uh, about three different uh, forms of work, I think we can uh, recognize them as, in in contemporary, quite um, up-to-the-moment research in cosmology. It turns out that they're, they're correlated as we try to push to earlier and earlier times in the history of our own observable universe. They seem to call for, or at least have been approached with, different forms of inferential reasoning. Uh, and they also, um, well, and so that's, the main, that's why I wanted to, to, to highlight these, these three. Um, just to orient us, I know some folks uh, in the room are thinking about many of these things all the time. For others, this might not be what you think about every day. Um, so welcome to your home. This is our observable universe. Here's, a, a, I think, a helpful way to start orienting ourselves. This is from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey collaboration. The observable universe we now know with great precision is just shy of 14 billion years old, and it went through many distinct types of epochs. And those call for different forms of uh, data that's available, different things that could even in principle be observed. And as I'll suggest, they call for different forms um, of kind of reasoning as well. So some of these uh, that we know a lot about by now are from some of the earliest moments that I'll talk quite a bit about, the so-called cosmic microwave background radiation. It's often called a snapshot. It wasn't literally one moment in time, but a very narrow window in time, at a particular moment in cosmic history, roughly 14 billion years ago. And then other kinds of data that are more familiar, longer, a much longer history, although we have sort of the latest, greatest, most up-to-date versions with things like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which are basically accounts of individual galaxies, not just counts, but positions and, and information about their, their motions. Each of these now are big, big data projects. So a single map of the CMB, the Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation, at the resolution that's now provided to us by international collaborations like the Planck Collaboration, the Planck Satellite Team, each uh, one map like that has basically 10 million data points in it, in a way that I'll, I'll unpack for us in, in a moment. Likewise, this extremely pretty map uh, by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, uh, these are really only some of our nearest neighbors, cosmically speaking. This already in- involves very high precision measurements of more than one million independent galaxies. Of course, there's many, many mo- more than one million galaxies. But these are extremely high resolution, high precision measurements going out to really just our nearest neighborhood, uh, only about two billion light years from home. It turns out on the scale of the universe, that's remarkably close. This is from light that's been traveling towards us for much longer. I want to say a little bit about, I'm going to focus mostly for this first part on the CMB, the Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation. It is a gift that has kept on giving for cosmologists and physicists now for a long, long time. It was accidentally detected, uh, as many of you might know, back in 1964. Uh, and since then, various teams have gotten better and better at trying to measure uh, its pro- some very subtle properties. So since the physics is very subtle, I'll give you instead a very simple, simplified cartoon. So what is the CMB? And our best understanding that this is a kind of remnant glow from an even earlier set of processes uh, within the past of our own observable universe. So at very early times after the hot Big Bang, the plasma that was filling the universe was so hot, the average energy per particle was so high, that any time two charged particles, like, for example, a proton and electron, every time they began to approach each other through sort of Coulomb electromagnetic uh, attraction to try to bind into a stable neutral hydrogen atom, any random particle near them would bust them apart because every particle, or most particles on average, had more energy than the binding energy of a stable hydrogen atom. So these things never had a chance to form. That means photons were trapped between charged particles. The universe was filled with a charged plasma, not neutral hydrogen gas, yet. And that meant that photons could travel hardly any distance at all. The universe was, in that sense, opaque. The mean free path of an individual photon was microscopically tiny. Those are the conditions 
that would have held up, uh, up to temperatures when the temperature of the plasma was greater than roughly 10,000 degrees Kelvin. And that corresponds to times after the Big Bang, up to not quite 400,000 years. So for the first 380,000 years after what we're going to call the Big Bang, the universe was a dark place because photons couldn't go anywhere. And then at that magical moment, the temperature of the plasma had cooled enough the average temperature per particle had fallen enough that now when, uh, say, a charged uh, pair like a proton and electron began to attract each other through electromagnetism, more often than not, that would win, that the average energy of their neighbors would no longer bust them apart. And so at that sort of calculable moment, photons became free. We say they began to free stream or they decoupled from the charged particles, which now are more and more frequently getting paired up into electrically neutral uh, hydrogen atoms. So only from that moment on was there anything like light that was able to travel macroscopic distances starting at roughly 380,000 years. And so today the universe is filled with this remnant glow. It's no longer so hot, the energy per photon is no longer at 10,000 degrees. As the universe has expanded and cooled for the next almost 14 billion years, the energy, uh, the, the, the wavelength of each of those photons has been stretched, their energy has been redshifted, so we now detect them as just a few degrees above absolute zero, just under three degrees, even though that when they first decoupled and began to travel macroscopic distances per particle, the energies were much higher. So there's more than just the fact that we should have a remnant glow. What people began to realize pretty early on is that re- that collection of light, which should be coming at us in principle from every direction in the sky, should actually uh, become a, a, a kind of mapping tool of the regions in the sky from, from whence they had um, begun to travel. They become uh, primordial density mappers. And this again goes back to ideas that Albert Einstein himself began to work out throughout the 19-teens. And we now call this gravitational redshift. And put again in cartoon form, in some regions in space from which these photons be, were finally allowed to start moving large distances, they happen to be coming from regions with slightly more mass and energy per volume than average, an, an overdensity. That means there would have been a stronger gravitational pull on those photons locally than neighbors coming from average or under-dense regions. So the photons that came from the slightly more dense than average regions had to kind of pay, had to expend a bit more energy to climb out of this gravitational well. So by the time that we detect them, or our friends do with the Planck satellite, they should have slightly less energy than average because they spent some getting out getting away from this slightly uh, more gravitationally attractive region. And likewise, some other photons will be blue shifted slightly more energy than the average. And so if there had been some primordial unevenness, a lumpiness to the distribution of matter and energy at very early times, that would create a kind of non-trivial gravitational uh, field, a slightly different gravitational potential here versus there. And that should get mapped even today in the behavior of the individual photons that that we measure from different directions in the sky. And now I'll go through this part pretty quickly. There's some really wonderful uh, reference works to to, uh, unpack this in more detail. But basically, when groups like the Planck team produce these really beautiful uh, false color images, these maps, these are very, very tiny variations in the temperature of photons as detected from different directions in the sky. The scale here is is a millionth uh, of a a single degree Kelvin. That's the scale, uh, well, tens or hundreds of of, um, microkelvin. And so we're going to measure the temperature, say, from that direction there, n is going to be my direction in the sky. We're going to base it on some average value at 2.726 Kelvin and then see how it varies across space. We can then do something that's essentially a fancy Fourier transform. Many of you have probably seen this. We're going to uh, uh, represent the sky in a series of spherical harmonics. What that means is these little ALMs become just numbers, just complex, complex valued weights. And these multipoles are sort of like a wave number. These are going, varying inversely with angular scale. And then we can perform statistics on the collections of these weights. Oh, I can't. <laughs> Our friends can. So they collect, you know, as I'll say in a moment, about 10 million of these separate ALMs. And then they can ask about the properties of that ensemble. I'll say more about what this ensemble averaging means in a second. It turns out to high statistical significance. Individual ALMs for each wave number and each um, 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 Uh, component M, they actually average to zero. That's a very strong indication that the universe, as captured in this snapshot from these early released photons, the universe was homogeneous and isotropic to a remarkably strong degree. I'll say more about that in a second, meaning there was no preferred direction or or preferred uh, location. It looked like smooth goop, which is where you want to live if you like doing mathematics. Smooth goop is easy to model. 
Uh, moreover, we can then ask about correlations. So what about the photon from there and from there, or from there and there? We can do all these comparisons among different directions in the sky and encode that in this two-point correlation function. So again, because of the, of, the, of the way we've decomposed this essentially kind of Fourier transform, one map like this from the Planck team corresponds to 10 million uh, seemingly independent data points, each of these ALMs. Now, I, I blithely said that we're performing an ensemble average here, but it's of a very peculiar type. This comes back to what it means to do cosmology from within the system you're trying to describe. So typically in other areas uh, in which we might have lots and lots of data points, if we talk about doing an ensemble average, that might mean at least one of two, two or maybe more things. We might collect many, many different observers' data and compare them. So the ensemble might be among an ensemble of observers. Well, we can't really do that. We're observing really from here now. Or it could be that we're going to take measurements from, by one observer of a large number of independent realizations of a system. Well, we can't do that either. We have one observable universe. And so we're not really doing ensemble averaging in the way that's typically done in other, say, laboratory or benchtop settings. We're really taking an average of the one map we have and saying internally, if we had pretended that each of those came from an independent realization, what are the statistical properties? And that's the basis for saying things like we have um, uh, homogeneity and isotropy. Nonetheless, if we take that kind of maybe uh, statistical subtlety um, for granted, then again, our, our friends at the Planck team can produce maps like these. Again, this is essentially the two-point correlation function that I mentioned before. And you can see the scale here is just still enormously small. To, to cut to the chase, the unevenness, the typical variation from any direction of the sky that the, that's now been mapped is about one part in 100,000. So at that very early moment, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, when this light first began to travel macroscopic distances, a photon coming from that direction of the sky, from that direction of the sky, and from that direction of the sky had the same temperature to one part in 100,000. Remarkably smooth. Now, how can we account for these now very large data sets, like these 10 million data points for a single CMB map and so on? What's become standard, in fact, is now called the standard model, is to appeal to this thing called lambda CDM. Lambda stands for the cosmological constant, as to say, we're going to assume, we're going to build a very simple model with very few moving parts. In fact, only six free parameters. We're going to call that our standard model. We're going to use that to compare with large data sets like the CMB maps. In this very simple few moving parts model, we'll say the bulk of the, of the matter and energy filling that toy model universe, that idealized universe, uh, was a cosmological constant, a kind of residual energy of otherwise empty space. And then, the, and then the next largest component is cold, dark matter. That's the CDM of the acronym. This is matter that is, um, has very little kinetic energy, so it's cold in, in a literal sense. It seems to, uh, uh, in to, to interact with other matter gravitationally. It can clump. It can lead to structure formation. It can make galaxies grow. But it seems not to interact, or at least to interact extremely feebly, with ordinary matter, or for example, even with light. Uh, my very dear colleague Tracy Slatier likes to say it's not really dark matter, it's transparent matter. Photons should travel right through this because fo even photons won't interact with this stuff as far as we can tell. So we build this extremely si purposefully simplified six-parameter model that builds in these assumptions. And then there's basically one moving part to that, what's called the scale factor. At any given moment in time, this idealized model is, is smooth, uh, homogeneous, and isotropic. And if we had put little tracers in there, then we'd see the distance between those tracers would change over time. And we, we model that with what's called the scale factor, just a scalar function of, of, of cosmic time. Then we appeal to things like Einstein's general theory of relativity uh, to say, well, how should that scale factor change over time given assumptions about the constituent parts? If there's so much fraction of the matter that's in ordinary matter of the sort of which we are made, some different fraction that's uh, radiation, like massless photons, some fraction that's called dark matter, some other fraction cosmological constant, then how should A of T have changed over time? That's now calculable. And there's one more set of inputs for this otherwise pared down six parameter simple model of lambda CDM. We put in by hand an assumption that there should have been some initial source of slight lumpiness to, to eventually account for things like that one part in 100,000 um, anisotropy in the CMB. We're going to postulate the simplest uh, possible uh, functional form for those anisotropies. We're going to have a power spectrum that's simply a power law. 
So we're going to have some amplitude as yet undetermined a priori, some tilt, some uh, exponent with how, how the power changes with, with wave number, inverse uh, wavelength. We'll put that in by hand and we'll ask what values of the amplitude and the, and the spectral tilt will best match things like these 10 million data point maps of CMB. Now we start doing big data science, like most of you or all of you in the room have been doing for a long time. I'm newer to this, but you folks have been doing it for a long time. So I mentioned this simplified model, Lambda CDM, has six base or six free parameters. These two I just mentioned, when we put in by hand some source of primordial unevenness, some primordial lumps, this, these, are, these are encoding how much ordinary matter versus cold dark matter. These last two I, I can say more about. They're more about how do uh, photons and electrons interact with each other at that moment of decoupling. And then we turn to other kind of well-established physics, mostly, frankly, atomic physics, applied now in a a more general curved or warping uh, relativistic background, to be able to calculate, given values for each of these parameters, what should we expect those two-point correlation functions to look like as a function of scale. So as we vary across uh, angles on the sky, what should those CLs look like from first principles if we started with this simple model and put particular values in there? And then we turn to things like Bayesian parameter estimation. We use Markov chain Monte Carlo simulations, MCMCs, to try to find a best fit set for all six of these otherwise not well-known numbers, given a large number of measured values for these two-point correlation functions. So again, most of you probably know this. What this means in practice is we start with a large number of walkers. They're actually called walkers. Uh, we, and they have, we start them at random points in parameter space. Let's say it starts at ns equals 1.2 and its neighbor starts at ns equals 0.98 or whatever. You calculate for that position the full set of the CLs you'd expect, compare that with the observed map, and then let the walkers walk, because walkers going to walk. So you let them move a little further and do it again, and you want to minimize uh, the, di- the difference between the observed and the calculated values. You do that until you find a kind of best fit. I should say, I don't know if Priya will agree with this, the, the terminology is walkers when applied to any old thing. We're doing astrophysics. Right? These have to be called skywalkers, and I hope that Priya will take that up. If nothing else comes out of this meeting, that's what I hope for most. Okay. Once we do that, then we can f- find best fit values for the six base parameters that describe this simplified um, model. Then we can use the same techniques to, es- to estimate what are called uh, derived or derivative quantities, other things of physical interest. What's the current rate of expansion? What's the actual amount of, dark, of, of uh, cosmological mm-hmm. constants, and so on? We can then consider extensions beyond the simplest possible model. Let's put in some other moving parts and see how those new parameters might be fit or constrained uh, by the same data sets. What's important to recognize, I want to wrap up, this is the first part of the talk, even if we had a remarkably close fit between the observed and calculated values for these kind of uh, ways of uh, parameterizing a CMB map, that would still leave open many, many kinds of questions, right? This is parameter estimation, not model choice, roughly speaking. We started with a very simple model. What justifies that? Why could we have started with, uh, with the assumption that our observable universe was so nearly homogeneous and isotropic? And to me, even more uh, compelling, what was the source of those primordial lumps that we put in with that very simple-minded um, power law spectrum? So let me talk about now briefly the second part, an area that I, that I uh, work on quite a bit, It's an idea to try to account for why Lambda CDM itself might have been such a successful model. What might have, in some sense, set up the conditions for that to be a good approximation. So there are a long series of of, uh, really clever and and challenging paradoxes that have been worked out long before, in in fact, uh, right around the time the CMB was first detected, back in the 60s, uh, by people like Robert Dickey trying to make sense of these very simple mathematical models of a universe that seems broadly speaking like ours, homogeneous and isotropic, within the context of Einstein's general theory of relativity. And they realized quite early on that there could be an overall shape to space. There might be a non-trivial curvature even on the longest length scales. That's at least allowed by the equations of relativity. And it wasn't clear um, why any particular value might show up in where we live. So there was a way to, to quantify that, take the ratio of the actual stuff per volume, the actual energy density in our universe, compared to some critical value. The critical value is like that Goldilocks value that happens to give you a, an exactly Euclidean geometry at any moment in time. More generally, one could expect there to be either a positive curvature, like the surface of a sphere, or a negative curvature, like uh, it's often called like a horseback riding saddle, it's um, a hyperbolic geometry. And there's only one magical value at a given moment in time of this stuff per volume that'll give you this kind of Goldilocks flat geometry. What Robert Dickey began to realize early on 
that Einstein's own equations that we thought would, should describe the evolution of such a system suggested that flat geometry is an unstable equilibrium point, like trying to balance a pencil on its tip. In principle, it could be done, but the slightest unevenness in that solution should push you further and further away from a flat universe. And so, a bit more quantitatively, the deviation from spatial flatness should go like 1 over a squared, that's the scale factor, that typical distance at a moment in time between two test objects, and also inversely with the energy density. If you think about that for just a few moments, you'd see that this deviation from flatness should grow over time. If the universe is filled with ordinary matter, where its density falls as the volume expands, that's like this matter-dominated case here, then this deviation should grow as the scale factor grows, and the scale factor has been growing like crazy for 14 billion years. If the universe were filled with radiation, with, with massless photons, it should grow, it should deviate even more quickly. And so if the universe appears anywhere close to being spatially flat today, even within several orders of magnitude, uh, then that, beca- that means it must, it suggested it must have been exponentially closer to spatially flat at earlier and earlier times. So if we see anywhere between, say, 0.3 and, and 1.8 today for this particular parameter, then that same parameter must have been tuned to something like 16 decimal places at around the time of one second after the Big Bang, which is another period where we think we know quite a lot about the universe. That's when uh, the so-called Big Bang nucleosynthesis kicked in. We have all kinds of information to try to measure. Do we understand physics at one second? And the answer is we think we do. So this looks like a a kind of uncomfortable fine-tuning. It was around that time that my dear friend and colleague Alan Guth I began thinking about these things. He actually heard Bob Dickey give a lecture on the so-called flatness problem. This photograph I love because it reminds me that not so long ago there was a rule at MIT, faculty should blend in as well as possible with their surroundings. And Alan did pretty well with his own, uh, his own blackboard there, green board. Anyway, here's Alan looking a bit younger back then. He was not working on cosmology at the time. He was actually coming out of the field of uh, high-energy particle physics. He was thinking about kind of exotic scenarios that could happen with still hypothetical forms of matter, at the time still hypothetical, like, uh, like the Higgs field. We heard about, about the Higgs field earlier, I think, um, uh, 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 evidence for which was, was accumulated really starting in uh, 2012. Alan was thinking about this uh, much earlier. He realized that in some scenarios, the energy density in the Higgs field, or a comparable field, could become trapped temporarily. It, would be, it could be in a state where there was a non-zero energy density trapped in that field that couldn't be released arbitrarily quickly, as if this marble were trapped in this divot. It would be a kind of a toy model of that. He then realized well, if, you, if that had happened on, within the very early universe, any time there was a, a, a value of the energy density that was constant in time, I don't mean constant in space at one moment in time, constant in time because it's trapped there and the marble can't get out right away, that should drive a very, very rapid growth in space. Not just that space would expand, it would accelerate. It would get bigger faster. In fact, it would grow quasi-exponentially. And I say other people, now we know in hindsight, had some similar ideas around the same time. Alan's paper, I think, really tied these things together in the most explicit way uh, till then. Now, we know when he did this because Alan was very nice to his future historian friends. This is why, again, I always make this plea to the rest of you. When you do your next amazing thing, it might be tomorrow, um, probably will be tomorrow, do us a favor, the other historians, write it down, put the date on it, use neat handwriting, please. Oh, my goodness. Put it in a box and tell us why you're excited. It helps if you tell us in all caps. It's a spectacular realization. Then we'll really pay attention because most of what historians do is really boring. Anyway, what Alan realized was that this kind of thing might really um, be able to address this conundrum that he'd heard Bob Dickey talk about not so long before. The idea was as follows. If you go back to that expression I showed earlier, during inflation, the stuff that's filling, that's dominating the energy balance of the universe isn't playing by the rules of, say, marbles in a bucket. It's actually uh, uh, behaving such that the energy density stays constant in time while the scale factor grows exponentially quickly. So the deviation should actually be driven towards zero exponentially fast. So now it might not be a mystery as to why the universe looks anything close to spatially flat. It might have been driven there by dynamical processes uh, in the very early universe. And so a prediction starting in, in 1981 was that our observed universe should be spatially flat to high precision. And it, when he uh, made that prediction, the astronomer said, too bad, omega is 0.3. You'll think of some other good idea tomorrow. Uh, and instead, now, the latest measurement is that it's one to much better than percent level accuracy. Likewise, and I won't go through it here, I'd be glad to chat more, Alan and soon other colleagues realize the same mechanism, not just expansion, but accelerated expansion, 
should also drive the universe to appear homogeneous and isotropic on large length scales. Maybe that's why lambda CDM, which just assumed that from the start, is actually not such an unreasonable starting point when trying to compare with data in that Bayesian parameter estimation. Then some of that magic began to happen right soon after Alan and, and a few others had similar ideas. They began to realize that not only should the universe in bulk on, on, on very large length scales, should it appear spatially flat, homogeneous, and isotropic, but there really must be tiny deviations, tiny departures, or lumpiness, and they'd be, in fact, unavoidable. And the idea, again, to sketch it here, much, it's, this, these calculations have been elevated to a high art uh, since then, but the idea is basically whatever form of matter like a Higgs field was driving this temporary uh, dramatic phase in the universe's history, that should have obeyed Heisenberg's uncertainty principle because we all have to. So if there's a quantum field, there have been unavoidable quantum fluctuations then as now. As the universe is stretching exponentially quickly, the amplitude of those quantum fluctuations gets amplified. If you imagine doing quantum field theory in a curved space-time, the effect is different than if you're just doing it in Minkowski space, in, in, in uh, ordinary space of special relativity. And more important, the typical wavelength of those perturbations should be stretched as every typical distance gets stretched, stretched with that scale factor. So you go from subatomic uh, scale quantum fluctuations to galactic seeding scale with a calculable spectrum. So just by treating uh, these things like quantum mechanics says we have to, out pops, out pops after a lot of work, but it turns out that standard derivation shows there should be a power spectrum of primordial unevenness, lumpiness, that will be characterized by an amplitude and a spectral tilt. Now the particular values for the amplitude and the tilt, of course, are going to depend on one's assumptions about that model of inflation that was uh, possibly uh, accounting for the very early universe behavior. And so again, I, I'm sure many have seen this many, many times. This might indeed rightly call to mind this, this uh, concern that John von Neumann uh, reportedly raised, that with four parameters you can fit an elephant to a curve, and with five you can make him wiggle his trunk. Are we in danger of overfitting? Right? And in some cases I think the answer is absolutely yes, but not in every case. So what's become more um, uh, typical for the last roughly 10 years, 15 years now in the field, is to try to construct types of inflationary models within a framework called effective field theory, which is different from just writing down some favorite model and, and calculating what you get out. It's actually trying to abstract a bit or, or kind of make an analogical leap from otherwise well-tested examples at, many di at, at quite different energy scales, well-studied well examples of other systems described by interacting quantum fields. You want to put in what seem to be generic ingredients, and then you want to build a quantitative model that is, is sort of humble, has a humility built into it. It's only meant to apply within explicitly delimited energy regimes. So it's not trying to say I've now conquered uh, a unified theory of physics at all possible scales, saying in this regime of interest, these should be the most relevant degrees of freedom, and we know how to try to model those. So I think it's a different kind of inference, right? It's not Bayesian parameter estimation by any means. It's trying to kind of extrapolate from features that have been well-tested empirically, for example, at the Large Hadron Collider or other Earth-based uh, um, um, facilities, extrapolate to much, much higher energies. This is absolutely a leap. We're extrapolating sometimes by many orders of magnitude, but extrapolating a kind of minimalist set of ingredients that we think we have other reasons to think are likely to still be relevant. And then you can quantify the corrections and check for internal self-consistency. This shouldn't apply ar across arbitrary energy scales. Does it at least apply to the energy regime of interest to you? So with my friends and colleagues for a number of years, we've been building these models within a kind of EFT framework, trying to take what we consider some of the most, what I would think are much, some of the best motivated generic features to try to model this otherwise quite hypothetical early phase in the universe's history. And I'll go a bit quickly here. Even the standard model of particle physics has now been tested uh, to extraordinary degree in, in facilities like the Large Hadron Collider. That has multiple scalar fields, fields that have zero intrinsic angular momentum. It includes the Higgs field, but it also includes others like the Goldstone modes. Every uh, um, attempt to move beyond the standard model just adds more of these so-called scalar fields in the mix. We think there should be more than one, multiple interacting spin zero fields active in the early universe, at least four from the standard model alone. Those we actually have a, a, a different kind of evidence about. Moreover, and this is a little more technical, there should be a certain way those fields interact uh, with the gravitational uh, field, the so-called non-minimal couplings. And I, maybe in the interest of time, um, I'll go over this, I'll, I'll skip this part. The idea is that there should be parts that you don't write down if you're trying to understand how particles behave in uh, the space of special relativity, 
And yet these are unavoidable. These are induced, whether you want them or not, once you have certain kinds of matter dancing around in a curved space time. This, again, feels like a generic feature, uh, not just a nice feature of my favorite model versus your favorite model. Moreover, because of the way these couplings uh, run with energy scale, we would expect these new coupling constants, these new parameters, to, uh, to generically be larger than one at these very high energy scales during inflation. I don't know if they should be 10 or 1,000 or 12.243, they should be bigger than what? Right? That's the level that I mean by analogical reasoning. Once you put in those two ingredients, you start getting potentials for these still kind of um, um, effective field theory models, the kind of humble models that have very specific uh, and indeed generic features. They have local maxima and local minima, ridges and valleys. And so the dynamics are actually quite easy to, to analyze. Anywhere one starts the system, the system will have an initial transient and then rapidly fall into some local minimum, some valley, and then inflate the universe until it finds the global minimum. And that's going to happen no matter what values of these constants you happen to have, as long as you had them there and they were larger than one. And so you have this strong attractive behavior. The dynamics across many choices of parameters start collapsing onto each other. Now, we can start comparing that framework of modeling with sort of what I call realistic ingredients to say, well, what should come out of that for things like a prediction for a map of the CMB? Well, now, again, you might hear the ghost of John von Neumann loudly in your ear. I don't hear it, but others might hear it. We now have, I built a two-field model. It has nine free parameters, and I just have to match six of them. Well, anyone could do that, right? So is this overfitting with a vengeance? I don't think it is. For because of the funny shape of the potential I showed you a moment ago, for these families of models... The predictions for what you should find in the CMB are independent of initial conditions with one caveat of the fields. So what would have been four independent numbers, it depends on only one combination of two of them. And all the things that are measured uh, in, in the CMB maps depend otherwise on a different ratio of two parameters. So actually all the information that to match 10 million data points in the CMB maps, we're matching six numbers to, uh, for, for these um, for these observables, with actually two independent parameters. Moreover, the predictions are incredibly insensitive to the others. So you have to actually push the system very far away by introducing exponential fine-tuning in the dynamics to get predictions away from what happens to be the best favored observational uh, results from groups like the Planck satellite. So that doesn't prove this happened in the early universe. It lends, I would think, a level of, let's say, inferential plausibility I don't think it's subject to overfitting. It's taking in, uh, well-motivated ingredients and saying they give generic outputs. And that I find very encouraging. So I'm going to wrap up this part, and I'll be very quick on the third part. So to wrap up this part two, early universe cosmic inflation is still hypothetical. We haven't proven that it happened, but I think it provides a plausible framework, a capacious and generative framework, with which we can try to understand why the other model worked as well as it did why Lambda CDM still is the go-to model when we have these you know, multi-million po data point um, uh, sets to consider. So this might account for why the other model with its own assumptions wasn't so bad after all. Within that framework, we use these effective field theory methods to construct families of models with we, what we think are well-motivated generic ingredients, and, we, and then we can actually make very quantitatively precise predictions. So we, we put in generic um, uh, features, and we can nonetheless make quantitative predictions for what should be um, coming out of that, and those we can then compare with the data. Now, that will only lend inferential weight to the starting point if inflation itself is not exponentially unlikely to have occurred. So this, are we replacing one just so story with another? And that's where I want to move briefly, briefly, to the last part. So inferences about initial conditions. And here I think I'll probably just do this one set of slides and I can talk more about our simulations uh, after, if you like. So many, many people in the field get very angry, like name-calling angry with each other, uh, when they start to make inferences about initial conditions. What could, have start, what, what could have set inflation starting? Is inflation likely or unlikely to have occurred? How do we know? What's the, what's the, uh, the measure with which we can determine uh, likelihoods or plausibility? This gets grown people um, red in the face. I think the fact that grown people get red in the face is actually very strange, very surprising to me for several reasons. Number one, we should just get along, but okay, so that's another extra reason. There are at least two theoretical limits and an empirical one for why this becomes a different sort of question to even argue over compared to either of the first two that I mentioned. Number one, before inflation began, the region, the space-time patch that would eventually grow to include all of our observable universe today, 
must have been exponentially smaller than anything we see around us today, because the whole point was it was growing exponentially quickly to grow into the, the enormous universe we have. For some models, the patch could have started so small, it was butting up against the kind of limits of a self-consistent description of space and time as given to us by something like general relativity. It's hitting up against a region where we know general relativity itself should break down, the so-called Planck scale. So why are we arguing about initial conditions if we don't have any guiding theory for Planck scale physics? That's question number one. Question number two, I find uh, even more, to me, more persuasive. There's a body of work going back, again, 40 40 plus years, the early 1980s, on what are called cosmic no-hair theorems, the most most prominent by a colleague named Bob Wald. These no-hair theorems suggest that under fairly general or generic assumptions, inflation-like expansion is a fixed point. Many, many types of dynamical systems flow to that, having started from very different initial conditions. So this should be an attractor in a phase space sort of way, this inflation-like expansion. So now you have a many-to-one situation. Many, many possible pre-inflationary states should flow into essentially the same, what would look like the same inflationary state. And that seems like it would erase information about whether any special properties were there for the initial conditions. I have an asterisk here. I can't, I can't help it. This is called the, the no-hair theorem. Uh, and so with colleagues like uh, Faraz Azhar and other colleagues as well, have been more recently a generalizing Wald's theorem, loosening the assumptions under which his original theorem held. And we found that, in fact, the universe was more bald than Wald. And again, I have bald jokes come to me naturally. Anyway, so an even broader class of conditions will have the same output, will flow into a, a, an inflation-like uh, state. So why are we arguing about initial conditions if we have general arguments to say that many, many types of things should have flowed in and therefore erased our knowledge, removed our, our ability to ask about what had come before? And that last part leads to this third part, the empirical limit. Even if inflation began within a region that didn't butt up against quantum gravity, which needn't have, if, if inflation persisted for more than this minimum duration, the least amount to then produce an appropriately or sufficiently homogeneous and isotropic universe, then all information about this, in these initial conditions at the start of inflation would have been stretched to scales that we literally can't access yet. They would be stretched beyond our current horizon. So any empirical data about such initial conditions, are, we would likely have to sit still and wait for a few billion years. Now, I have tenure. That's not a big challenge to me. I'm happy to sit still. But for the others of us who need to get a job, that's not a great proposition. So why people argue till they're red in the face about, imp- about trying to reason about the initial conditions, when we're, we likely don't have any possibility of empirical data, and there's other theoretical reasons to, reason, to think this might not have been so compelling anyway. So I think there are many reasons why this third form of reasoning is, um, is most different from the first two. And I'll just say very quickly, what people then do is build toy models, simulate using very, very self-consciously simplified models, and so asked, do these flow into a smooth inflating patch or not? I was able to do a quarter million simulations on Amazon Web Services. It cost me 62 bucks. That was the best investment ever. And we can now start doing actually statistics. We can actually now make phase space arguments for these admittedly very simplified models, where now at least we have something like a measure. Is there a certain volume of this phase space of this toy model that flows into inflation in the face of extreme initial lumpiness? Is some other volume that would have flowed into inflation but doesn't? And it turns out there's almost a kind of Louisville theorem, which you didn't expect going in, that the total volume that yields appropriate inflation, even in the, in the midst of these very large initial lumpiness, is actually conserved. You win some and you lose some, and you, and you lose as much as you gained. And so now we get closer to something like a way to say, is it plausible, instead of just saying, I like it, I don't like it. We can begin to get something like a measure, admittedly for a very, very toy model, but we have basically no other empirical inputs to guide our reasoning. So I'm going to to conclude here. In many ways, cosmology is a big data field like like all of yours. Enormous data sets, fancy Bayesian-style parameter estimation, all that. We're not done. You might have heard about things like a Hubble tension. Sometimes the fits from one kind of data set don't match the fits for the same parameter from a different data set. So that keeps us busy still. But in other ways, cosmology, I think, is rather unique. I'm curious if this sounds like uh, work you're familiar with in other fields. We have only one observable universe. We're embedded within it. We can't perform controlled experiments. The IRBs won't let us, right? We can't actually go in and intervene. Uh, Nor can we compare precision observations across a large ensemble of independently prepared realizations. We got what we got. So within that space, we have, as I've tried to argue, these sort of three distinct forms of of inferential reasoning as we try to account for earlier and earlier times of our own universe's evolution.
Thank you. I have a question that only stupid biologists can ask. Um, how is it possible for an infinite body, or like a universe, have a shape, which implies an outer boundary? Oh, good. Thank you. No, that's an excellent question. Uh, it, it, it doesn't have to be a boundary. You can, it, it can, it's a local measurement. So you can, for example, um, that's, it's, it's, uh, even for biologists, it's a great question. So that's not a dumb question at all. Let me, let me bring up these cartoons quickly. What we can do is ask about the behavior, yeah, like over here. We could ask about, do, do two lines that are parallel here converge or diverge a finite distance away? So we don't have to sample a, an infinite space. So it's really asking about within, within macroscopic but not infinite length scales, there should be devi- measurable deviations from Euclidean geometry. But it's true only if this uh, change is gradual, like in your pictures, but it could be not. Say there are lo- localities that have different uh, parallel lines would go in this way, and uh, whatever, in the other space, it'll go differently. I, I, maybe so, we, should, this so then, we, might, we might have to talk about it over coffee. I think the idea, remember, this is now in an, an idealized framework. We assume the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. So, so we're already saying that there's a, we've imposed a lot of symmetry on this toy model space. Within that, we can imagine performing a series of local measurements to discern positive versus negative curvature. Okay, good. Thank you. Oh. Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, so I can't claim to understand uh, well, most of the cosmology, but just... Uh, Coming from philosophy of science, uh, when philosophers of science think of inference, they tend to think of probabilistic inference, sometimes Bayesian. Uh, so when they see something like you know the cosmological con- uh, constant or fine tuning, they tend to start to give arguments, you know, having to do with probabilities. Mm-hmm. And what struck me about your talk, and um, you'll tell me if this sort of seems right, is that it seemed that lost the reasoning, at least till you got to the initial conditions, really wasn't about probabilities. It was about kind of giving a dynamical description that would allow for a stable outcome for things where sort of it was unstable, you wouldn't expect it. And that sort of strikes me as interesting, but interestingly different. So. That's, that's interesting. So I think there's a combination there. In other words, there's definitely, um, let's say, non-empirical inputs all over the place. Like, let's start from a simple toy model, lambda CDM, and then sort of try to reason why that was a, a, a plausible starting point, right? So we want, to, we want to back up that. And that's different from saying, what's the probability that lambda CDM is right? That's why I, I had this comment that we use, we're using Bayesian statistics for parameter estimation, not for model choice, yeah. right? And so we could say, well, why do we fix on lambda CDM? It's easy and tractable. It is self-consistent. It assumes things that the, CD, that the CMB sends to reinforce, like extreme homogeneity and isotropy. So it's not a, it's not a random choice. Uh, but there is work going on, for example, about what if, we don't, what, what if we don't start from lambda CDM? What if we don't start from general relativity, right? So those, those things also go on, but you get, you get stuck really fast because now we have multiple multi-million data point data sets, and it's very hard to match them to the, to the requisite accuracy once you start departing from that baseline choice. That's why it's beca- it became, it, so to speak, it earned the place of standard model. Uh, it was one among many competing ones, and it's become the framework to keep coming back to because other things break it worse. I, I think it's, uh, and that's different from saying it's 98% you know, confirmed. You say that's a framework within which we then ask more specific questions. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I had a, a very uh, general question. So thanks, first of all, for a beautiful talk. Um, I wondered how to think about the EFT framework. So there's, there's one way of thinking about it as a, as a way of giving you a clear way of exploring a space of possible theories right. with the idea that there's maybe a further question of what, once you've narrowed down the parameter space, what is the final model? There's mm-hmm. other, a different way of thinking about it, which I sometimes think Mukhanov might have this view, which is just that further question isn't one that you should be concerned about. That once you have an EFT of inflation, that's it. That's the sort of end of the story. So I was wondering if, yeah. if you fall into one of those camps or if I'm misdescribing. That's great. So there's a, there's a fascinating dissertation from the philosophy department at, um, <laughs> at uh, Western Ontario I'm going to direct you to. Uh, it was directed by Professor Christopher Smink, I think it was, <laughs> uh, your student, uh, Demetrios. So, uh, so I'll, I'll summarize his thesis very poorly and very quickly. Um, 
One big philosophical challenge I still find really fascinating personally within the framework of EFTs is, is what's real? I mean, it, the, the implications of EFTs for any kind of classic questions of scientific realism is worth at least one very detailed dissertation with more than that, right? So as I approach these EFTs, I think of them in my kind of casual non-philosopher way as saying, these are good enough degrees of freedom that capture the relevant phenomena good enough within a regime that's good enough, right? If we look at all those good enoughs. You know, particle physicists historically have not been very humble people, right? I mean, literally, they were among the most obnoxious on the planet. But there's a, there's a kind of epistemic humility now. It's not, I found the one granified theory, I found the string theory, I found it. It's saying, in this bit of regime, these look like the relevant degrees of freedom to ma- to, 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 that allow me to, to match what's been found and, and sometimes predict new things to look for in that regime. So in that, it's still generative. It's not merely curve fitting. And that's what I, what I find very, again, sort of generative about it. There's new things to look for that we can ask about with some kind of modest confidence because we have a framework that we think is adequate. And if it's not, if it starts div- uh, d- diverging wildly, then we have to re- re- revisit that. But it's different from saying, I've proven that this was the field or this was the model. In this regime of interest, the model acted like that. It's an as-if form of reasoning that nonetheless can, can lead to new things to look for, new phenomena. And that, and, and you know, as, as Isidore Rabi once said in, in the Oppenheimer hearing, what more do you want, mermaids? Like, that's pretty great, right? But it's a very different framework from saying, here's re- there's really uh, you know, a Higgs field, there's really an inflaton, inflaton field with this value. Saying, in this regime, it acts as if. And that already becomes powerful and generative. And, and that's where I tend to sit with those questions. Uh, and when you find these kinds of quite generic ingredients can lead to, like, I can't push it away from the best fit values, that's not a measure argument, that's not a probability, but it's like, there's certainly a plausibility argument. Or, or, and, and that's where I'm happy to live in terms of the sort of, what does EFT uh, do for me? Yeah, thanks, Chris. I want to thank David. Thank you. Thank you.